good morning. Um, those, of you, wow, those of you who don't know, my name is Brandon, and I am the youth pastor here, and we never had the opportunity to use a table and a stand, so we're going to go for both today. Um, so typically, uh, when I come up here to teach, to preach, I uh, usually got some kind of illustration where I'm, you know, going to drink milk, you know, through my nose or something goofy like that, or, um, or I've got some really crazy funny story, and I don't have either today, all right? So uh, we're going we're gonna to buckle up, and today we're just going to, we're going to dive in and we're going to go. Um, let me, let me say this to, to kind of just kind of paint what, what I need to, to go with today. So if my goal is I want to create a picture for you right here, this is where I'm at, okay? But what I have to do is I'm going to have to go, all right, stack it all right here. And so we're going to have to go through all this stuff and then it's going to direct us here. Make sense? Everybody good? Everybody good? Okay. All right. If something doesn't make sense today, uh, it's because I worked last night and I got off, got home about 5.30 this morning. So uh, I have, <clears throat> I got a few guys that are going to pass out some papers. When it was time for me to turn in my sermon slides and my and notes for, um, for the bulletin, I wasn't ready. And so uh, I've printed up these uh, these verses that we're going to be referring to that are right here, okay? But I'm not going to, they're not going to be on the screen. Because I think it's important for you and for me that when we walk out of here, that this isn't just some message that we walk away from in 30 minutes, we can't remember what we talked about. So what, what we've done is, if y'all just hop up and they're going to pass out these little papers and these are for you to take home. And, and I don't know if I have enough or whatever, but if you're by somebody and you got a phone, take a picture of it, take it with you. These are just scripture references. So this is your homework for the week. We're going to talk about this this morning, but what I want you to do is to go, when you get home, you know, whether it's Tuesday, Thursday, whatever, and you have time to sit down and go, hey, I took a few notes on the back of this piece of paper. Okay, this makes more sense in the context of what he was talking about. Oh, I get it. So, so sometimes we can pass over all those things in a message on a Sunday morning and then never come back to it. I just want you to come back to it. I think it's important and it's crucial. <clears throat> so they're passing those out. If you didn't get one, need one, just stick your hand up. They'll find you. Okay. All right. So here we go. Um, all right. Cool background. I didn't do that. Charlotte did that. Thank you. Uh, so if we look at scripture, all throughout scripture, we will find men and women who have these intimate, deep, longing relationships with the Lord. We will find them all over the place. And so we're going to touch on a few of those this morning. And, and, uh, and but this longing that they had almost seems uh, foreign to some of us. Because if, uh, if you take King David, okay, we, we say he's a man after God's own heart. What happens in King David's, his progression of his story and his life and all this stuff, he's, what happens is uh, sin creeps in. And David becomes aware of it. And so when he becomes aware of it, he's going, oh, my soul. God, why are you so downcast on me? I feel this separation between you and me. We were close and now there's a, there's a separation. And God, what do I need to, I've got to have you. I can't, he's going, I got to stay up all night. I can't even, I can't sleep if there's a, if there's a rift here. He's going, I can't, I, he's longing and he's going, please God. He's begging God, restore to me the joy that I found in my salvation in you. Please restore that. And we are in the Bible Belt, and uh, in our westernized society, we come up with very, you know, little cute trinkets and, and little coffee mugs that say stuff like, you know, 
uh, you know, restore to me the joy of my salvation. And, and so while his angst and his longing and his, his ache and his heart because of that separation, we marginalize that to T-shirts, bumper stickers, and coffee mugs. He's going in agony. Once what was once fresh and vibrant and alive has grown stale. And he was in agony over it. And, and guys, to be honest, there, there's going to be part of this this morning, just letting you know this, this is going to be heavy. Because I'm going to come right at you in your face. Because this is what I've been dealing with. So um, he goes on and he says, as a deer pants for water, so my soul longs for you. He was so distraught that when it came to walking intimately with God, that, that he stayed up all night through the watches of the night. And we study these men like David or, or even Habakkuk, and we'll touch on him in a minute, and, and uh, but you know, he even in Habakkuk is going. I don't care about food. I don't. I don't care if I don't have shelter. I don't. I don't care if I have money. He's going. If I have you, I've got what I need. And we study Paul, the Apostle Paul, and he's going. I count thing, all things uh, as rubbish next to the surpassing greatness of knowing you. If I don't know you and I'm not close to you, it's it's dung. So the question, you know, is why don't we groan like that? Why aren't, why aren't we bothered by that? Because I talk about us, you know, David and his relationship, what's, what was alive and vibrant and now has grown stale. I mean, if I walked around this room and said, is that true for you? I, I, most of us. At some point in time in our journey, that's got to be true if not today, but why aren't we aching like him? Why, why don't we, why are we content with, with our weak levels of, of shallow intimacy with Christ? Why are we content with our sin? It's like we've gotten so comfortable with the fact that, that we read these things and, 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 and regard things as God, we, as godly, they're, they're foreign and they're hard to get to and we don't really press into them. I mean, where's the man or the woman who, who will awake, stay awake all night long and say, God, I, I, I've just got to have you. I feel this separation and I need you. And I'm not going to sleep until I hear from you. I mean, where are they? It's almost like they're extinct. Why don't we long? Why don't we, why don't we desire? I mean, we've marginalized so many things to going, man, church was great because we had a lot of people here. Hey, that song was fantastic. Okay. Praise team was good. Okay, all that's good. It's, it's the coffee mug. God's going, God's not, in, not impressed by the number of people or, or that we can play all these instruments or whatever. He's impressed when we've pressed into him. Because we're not longing. And the thing is, is we know so much in our, in our big fat heads. We got all this scripture and we know all this stuff. But our soul is nowhere near It's nowhere near uh, uh, the impact that would make life change. And we seem to be okay with it. And I just don't understand why that doesn't just scare the lights out of us. And we just seem okay with it. <clears throat> so I think that one thing that's happening is this. It's a thing called idolatry. <clears throat> And I don't mean like worshiping some monkey or, you know, or, or whatever, some little golden trinket or whatever. I don't mean that. So if I define idolatry, 
it, I would say, desire. That it's something that, you know, uh, and, and look, all desires that we have are not evil or wicked, but it's the desire that we take that we've got a closed fist around, that we hold too tight. We hold, and, and, and we don't want to let go, and we go, this is a non-negotiable. And we go, we go to God and we go, okay, God, I, I, you're, I'm yours. I'll do whatever you want. But this thing, hey, I'm here. I'm here. But this thing. And see, what happens is, is, is God's going, hey, look, I want to talk to you. I want this closeness with you. But you, you've got something really tight in your hand and you're holding on to it. You're holding on so tight that... that I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about it. And look, the things that we hold on to so tight, they could be relationships, it could be stuff, trinkets, it could be your kids, it could be your marriage, it could be our country, safety, it could be anything. But we close our hands tight around it. And we're telling God, I don't want to let go of that. And we're going to get to, we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But it's a big deal. In Ezekiel 14, it's in your little note thing. You can go and read that this week. But but talk about it talks about that. To come to God intimately. We, we, we come to God and we want intimacy and we want closeness and we want that. But we come with an idol. And he doesn't want to talk about anything except. So every time that you press into God and that you, you go and you draw near in intimacy, he's going to say, hey, what's in your right hand? What, what have you got closed up over here? And it's not, it's not because he needs to know. He already knows. And what, what ends up happening, especially here in the Bible Belt, Christ help us, uh, what ha what's happening is, is that we all are contented with this shallow version of what it means to follow Christ. And we refuse to press in deeply because we know if we do, this non-negotiable is going to be front and center. And we're not interested in giving that up. And we find our lives just playing out. And, and look, I don't, I don't really... I, I've been in ministry for a long time, and, and I really don't believe you have to be godly at all to be a churchman. I think all you got to do is show up on Sundays and play your part, learn the language, raise your hands at the right times, read the right books. And in the end, what happens is, is there's no real intimacy with God for yourself. You instead, and follow me here, you live vicariously through the vibrant faith of others. And that's why everybody down here in the Bible Belt loves to quote preachers. Few people ever quote the Bible themselves. because they're not going to get into it themselves because the Lord's going to do business with them if they are and talk about the closed hand. But if all we do is listen to, listen to Chuck Swindoll or John Piper or Anthony Miller or one of those guys and all we do is regurgitate what they've said, we come off looking godly without ever having to discuss what's really going on. It's grown men playing in a kiddie pool. It's tragic because there's so much more for us. We don't walk deeply ourselves and we don't, we don't know him intimately ourselves and we keep our hand closed around what we really idolize. But that's not the only thing. Pride. Pride can absolutely devastate. I mean, <laughs> God, 
God ordained the, the universe in such a way where, where he even said, I will not know, you know, for, uh, I'm, he says, I'm going to know you or know them from afar. I'm going to know pride from afar. They are not going to draw near to me. And here's why. Because he's going, when I get, because listen, when I give them a word, when you hear a word on a Sunday morning and you're going, somebody goes, hey, you know, that's, they're thinking, that's not really for me. And you're thinking, man, I, I sure wish Kathy was here to hear that. She needs to hear that. And that's pride. Pride in the evangelical community is us pressing in and humbly walking before the Lord ourselves. If, if we, we've got to get the pride out. But we think we don't have problems. We don't have issues. And, and because we define life morally. Like, hey, I'm a good guy. You know, I'm not really struggling. You know, I, I do good things. I show up to church. I help. I, you know, I, I do all these things. And I'm here to hear the word and then to help those people that. And I, I, I'll get them fixed. I'll help them. And then you live in this unbelievable world of deceit where everyone else is the problem and it's never you. That's pride. Like you've been fired 18 times from your job, but it was everybody else's fault. You can tell me, you know, like uh, you've had 340 friends since the third grade and, and they're so intimidated by you spiritually that it's their problem. And you just love Jesus so much that it's just threatening to them and on and on. And that's pride. And it's devastating. It's devastating because in the end, you expect everyone else to be the very thing that you're not. And God's not going to draw near to that. He says, the proud I know from afar. And then there's the hardening work of God. And, and sometimes God just, just hardens the heart of a man. And down here we, uh, in the evangelical capital, uh, in the Bible Belt, we don't, you know, we don't like the idea. But listen, I, you know, and I like the warm fuzzies and I, I like good feeling Christianity and, you know, the, the, the t-shirt that's got the deer on it next to a stream and, you know, as the deer pants for the water, all that stuff, that's, that, all that's fine. But God will sometimes harden the heart in the midst of even wearing that t-shirt. Because a t-shirt doesn't mean anything. But I would say if you're here today and you want intimacy and you want this closeness or you feel this rift or you know that something has, has, has not just allowed you to get so close to God and you, you realize that, hey, I would say good news is, is maybe God hadn't hardened your heart and you're, you're in a good spot. So, but because of idolatry and pride, um, that rift is there that separation. Now look, nobody, nobody comes out and goes, hey, I'm prideful or, or I have an idol. It comes out in different areas of relational uh, distress, dysfunction. It comes out in vanity. It comes out in envy or lust. And they never really, uh, the, but the, the pride and the uh, idolatry are what take root and the other things are the expressions of it. Here's another one. There's another issue. And this is, this is one. Y'all ready for this one? Okay, kind of heavy, I know. So there's pride, there's idolatry, and then there's, there's, <clears throat> I have a hard time saying it. Y'all ready? Money. Oh, here we go. Talking about 
talking about money. Everybody gets real nervous. Grab your purse. Listen, I'm not, I don't believe I need a jet to go share the gospel with the nations and I don't wear cufflinks. So there's not a special offering for all this stuff today. But scripture tells us don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where it's temporary, where, where a moth can destroy it. People can steal it or at best you die and your children splurge. Don't do that. Not when you can store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where none of that happens. And he says, hey, listen, instead of sowing into this, this present economy, let's live a life for a future economy where our treasure is there also is our heart. Here's what I mean. Where our treasure is, there also is our heart. It's also our emotions. There is also our spirit. And where the emotions are and where the spirit is, there your heart is. And the reason that money is so difficult is because it will call you a liar. Money will call you a liar. Here's what I mean. You can down here run your mouth all you want about how generous God is and how great God is and how much you love him, love him and, and how beautiful he is. You can get John 3.16 tattooed on your throat. I don't care. You can have all the ichthuses on the back of your car. You can wear that t-shirt we've been talking about. You, so you can, you can just run your mouth about all that come to church, play the religious game. But in the end, if your money is your money and is all spent on the things that you want, you have no concept of a greater kingdom and a greater purpose for which that you are here. And that money was given to you because money doesn't have an opinion. Money, money doesn't love you or hate you. It just betrays you and shows you who you really are. So if you're spending 200 bucks at Starbucks and, and you're giving away $3 to, to help feed the needy or the hurting, there's an issue. And we won't take it to any other level there, but but, I mean, the problem is, is we, we don't check. So I've given you homework and, and in hopes that you will go through these scriptures and go, and then maybe remember something that was said and go, is that me? We don't really want to look where our treasure is. Because that's going to reveal where our heart is. And look, he says, nobody can serve two masters. You're going to chase God. You can't chase God and money. And I'll try to explain it. Um, but both have a mastery over you or can. You're either going to chase God and chase God's purpose as our treasure And that we're going to see everything that's under that as a subordinate underneath given to us by God, for God. So our money, <clears throat> our homes, our cars, our free time, everything that has been given to us for him. If that's the case, then you're mastered by God. But if not, are we mastered by, by money and, and the things that, and the stuff that is offered there? So what tends to happen is, is that we chase, <clears throat> excuse me, if 
We chase that. We chase money. God becomes our little errand boy to run around and get us the things that we want. We ring the little bell of morality and we go, of morality and religion, and we go, hey, I've been a nice guy. I go to church. I teach a Sunday school class. I do this. I do that. Uh, ding, 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 ding. Get me what I want. And then when he, you know, hey, I want a bigger house. And then when he doesn't, we get angry. And then we go, hey, I've, I've done this and I've done that. And I, I'm, 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 you know, you owe me health. And that's what happens is when we chase this and, and you try to attach Christ's name to it. Christ becomes the butler or the maid for you. And he fetches things for you and you get angry. There's the parable of the talents. It's in your note page and I want you to read through that. Um, most of you are probably familiar with that. If not, um, I, I want to just touch on that real quick. And I'm still, I'm still building over here to get to here. So just hang with me a little longer. Um, some people... They take that text and they think that it's really about a talent. And, you know, it's, it, you know, they, they think like, hey, if you, you know, a talent, like if you juggle, you know, you should juggle for Jesus. And I agree, you know, hey, if you're a juggler, juggle for Jesus. That's great. But whatever. Um, but, but that's not really what that whole text is about. That whole text is starting to, it starts to really reveal who we are. And where our heart is, that text is about opportunities. It's about, um, you know, what, what do you do with that spare bedroom at your house? What do you do with that big house that you have? What do you do with extra cash? What do you do with the boat that you bought that hasn't touched water in six months? What do you do with your vacation time? What do you do with your free weeknights? What do you do? And if you don't understand those as gifts, you probably need to travel more or read more. But what are you doing with those opportunities? Those opportunities will reveal to you what you really value, what really is your treasure what you're really after and it also reveals idolatry or pride or both so how do you see the world you see the world through the lenses of a greater kingdom a greater call a greater purpose eternal pursuit you see the world like that I'm done with my intro. Now, Matthew 13 this is where we're at. I know some of y'all are worried. That was his intro. So in Matthew 13, here's what we find. Jesus is talking. And he's teaching. And we find ourselves in the middle of seven straight stories where Jesus, he says, the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of heaven is like, and he does this seven times. The first four times, he's in front of a large crowd with his disciples and he's teaching. The last three times, the crowd has gone, he's alone with his disciples. So of the seven, I'm going to focus on two number five and number six and so it's going to be in Matthew 13 I think yeah there we go good job Charlotte okay yes it says the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up then in his joy he goes and he sells all that he has and buys the field. 
the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in the search for fine pearls who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now, I could probably spend the next two hours talking about that, about what the kingdom of heaven is, what the kingdom of God, and what it's not. I'm not going to. So really, you could probably spend about a 40-week series on that. Um, but there's no time today. So, uh. so the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, some say that these are two separate ideas. And I don't believe that's the case. I believe that they're the same thing. So let me try to explain that. Um, when we're walking on earth, um, when Jesus was walking on earth in the first century, Jews, they were expecting him and wanting him. Uh, those who believed that he was the Messiah and, and that he was coming to establish and overthrow the Roman occupation and set up the kingdom of God, the throne of David, the kingdom of heaven on earth. But Jesus over and over again is going, he refutes that idea and he's like, in fact, you know, uh, there, there are those that, the, that say that the kingdom of God is over here and he's saying over there and, and he's going, it's, it's neither it's within you. And so that, they're going, I don't understand. I don't, I don't get it. So it's the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven is not a place or a location. But rather, it is rule and reign here. Rule and reign here. So the kingdom of God in this text is re, it's not referring to a place over here or over there. It's referring, referring to, does he have rule over your heart? Does he have reign here? Jesus said the, the kingdom of God is coming and he says, you know, there's power, there is power where on the inside there is demonic there's lustful, there's wicked, there's envious, there's, there's dark and unbelieving, and it's all destroyed by the salvation that is within. And that salvation brings the light and the hope and the healing and power, and, and, and the kingdom of God is ruling over the hearts of men and women. So let's read that again. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then, in his joy, he goes and he sells all that he has to buy that field. And the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding the pearl of great value went and sold all that he had, and he bought it. Okay. So the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, the rule and the reign of the omnipotent God of the universe over our souls is so infinitely valuable that at the loss of everything else on earth, in order to get it, is a happy transaction. I've lost everything, but I've gained him. There was this separation, but I've gained him. I've removed all that stuff. I've taken the idol and I've let it go. There's a guy named Job in the Old Testament. It's referenced, go read it this week. In a matter of moments, his entire business collapses. He goes bankrupt, his marriage goes south, his kids, his children die. He, cont he contracts a disease and he tears his clothes and he basically worships and he says, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I will return. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So if to know Christ is to walk with him deeply, if that means that I lose my children, I lose my business, my business tanks, my my, I, I contract a disease. 
praise Christ. It's hard to say. And in Habakkuk, he's going, I don't care if I starve to death. I don't care if there's no cows. You know, you can take my cows. You can take over everything that I have. If, if, if it means I get to be close to him, then take it. Or if, if eating a 12-ounce filet, medium rare, is going to create worship in my heart, and kill the cow. So follow me. If having money is going to bring you closer to the Lord, then give me money. But if it's going to rob me of intimacy and closeness, then make me poor. to struggle with a difficulty or a sin or a physical ailment all the days of my life on earth just so that I might cling to you then send the ailment why because apparently it's worth it not only worth it the best thing we've got but in scripture said in joy they sold everything not begrudgingly they found joy in it blessed be the name of the Lord so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end this with a question. And I think the question I want to end with today is this. Will you buy the field? I'm even nervous about saying something like that because here's the thing is that we, we, we can't buy anything from God. We're not going to bribe God. We're not going to, he doesn't have anything for sale. It's a paradox. It's like the Apostle Paul shows us, you know, and he probably said it the best in Philippians. That's in your, in your notes. Read it later. But, but basically he's going, I want to take hold of which has taken hold of me. It's not an exchange where I'll stop being bad so that Jesus will love me more. I want to take hold of, of that which has already taken hold of me. I want to chase the one who has already caught me. So let's be honest. You know what I'm asking for? You know, you know what this whole thing is about today? Courage. pleading with you to have the courage to spend time with the Almighty and go, is this me? To have the courage to truly examine your heart and your life and, 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 and what do you truly value in this evangelical culture that is so watered down and so weak and huge and has real no impact on the world around us. to look deep in your heart quit lying to yourself you can lie to me all you want I'm a pastor I've been there people lie all the time and I don't care but you don't have to stand in front of me and give an account for your life How long? 
can we walk lying to ourselves? And in the evangelical culture where the very air that we breathe just could be poisonous. And I'm asking you to be honest with yourself. And I don't know what that looks like for you. But I know that some of you in here, there's some folks in here that, man, your bank account is overflowing. Some folks in here go, man, I got $30 in there. And then there's some that go, man, I wish I had $30. Looks different for every one of us. But what I'm saying is, is you've got to wrestle. You've got to wrestle and lay your life in front of the Holy Spirit and say, God, I need you to examine me and reveal to me what I'm holding on to if it's not you. And all the little trinkety, gadgety things that that we do to pretend down here is going to get exposed. It's our best shot at repentance. Because we're so prideful that we think that repentance is only for the lost. That's what I'm pleading for, is the courage to look deep, because it's our best shot at repentance. Everything else is just frilly, cheap imitation, because we think, man, I don't cuss, I don't go to R-rated movies, I don't, you know, I'm a good husband, you know, I'm a good mother. Ah, those are just small pieces of it. The results of it. So the question is, will you buy the field? Will you have the courage to do the painful work of self-examination? If I were going to title today's sermon, it would be this. (laughs) Probably not one people would turn back to for sure, but uh, a terrible loneliness. That's what I'd title it. Let me tell you why. Um, I call it a terrible loneliness because when all is said and done, you've got to wrestle with the Holy Spirit. And, you, and, and for some of you, you know, as a husband and wife, you're, you're going to have to wrestle with some of this. But I don't think that you can effectively wrestle with that until you've wrestled with it as an individual. And it's terribly lonely. Because you start looking at what you truly value with your money, with your time, with all the things that God has blessed you with. You start to really see what you really value and how you really see the world. I think it's our best shot. That the Holy, the Holy Spirit manifesting in us and setting us free. Free from temporary trinkets. And being free from being owned by them. So what would happen if we actually lived out what we truly believe? I mean, the resources that would be available. The life change that would occur. The Holy Spirit's power would flow So will you buy the field? It's going to cost you everything. And that's heavy. Let's pray. Father God, you are so good, so patient. God, I know that today's kind of heavy and even long and all that, but God, I, I just ask that that we would find the courage to sit still, to 
hold open hands as we do self-examination, self-look. God, we need you. Without anybody looking around, just, just right where you are, as an individual, you're sitting face to face with the Almighty. And I believe that it's in a room this size that God is speaking to someone today, maybe multiple people, about what you truly value in this world. Because the truth is, many of us value ourselves over everything. So I'm asking to find the courage even in the next few moments so that we are grown men and women that get out of the kiddie pool and dive deep into the things of God and that we could walk intimately with him and when sin has crept its way into our hearts and our lives like David we go I got to have you I can't stand this distance between us I've got to be near this altar's open come and you can pray I'll be here down front to pray with you pray where you're at but don't leave without dealing with the Lord you've got homework this week God I ask you to speak and to move and do your thing would you stand